All right. Good morning, church family. Will you say a word of prayer with me before we uh, open up God's word together? Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessing of coming here together this morning to enjoy the fellowship, to give you the praise that you deserve, Lord, and worship. Father, our worship continues now as we open up your word, and we ask that your Holy Spirit would illuminate it for us this morning, that we can understand and apply your word today. Thank you for the scriptures, God. Thank you for this passage in Luke that we're about to unpack. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, we're back in Luke. We're going to be in chapter 7. And uh, let me just catch you up in case you haven't been with us in our study of the Gospel of Luke. Essentially, at this point of Luke, we've been seeing week after week how Jesus, the Savior of the world, our great God and Savior, he's been coming into a broken world and confronting its brokenness head on. Uh, Jesus has come to reverse the curse of sin. And, And last week, we saw a particular instance, or not last week, but last time we were in this passage in Luke 7, we saw the loss of the widow of Nain. So this woman... Her husband had already died, and then her only son dies. And so she was completely broken. And in that culture, you have to understand, this was uh, her means of survival, was having male relatives. And so uh, she was destitute. She was broken. And then Jesus shows up at just the right moment and brings her son back to life and restores her brokenness. It was a resurrection miracle. It was a ray of light in a dark world. And in today's passage, we're going to see brokenness show up again. Uh, But this time, however, it's not with a widow whose name we don't know. It is with somebody that we know very well in our study of Luke. It's with John the Baptist. We're going to see John the Baptist as a broken man in this passage. We find him struggling in a dark night of the soul. And I know it's been quite some time since we saw the story of John's birth. It was in Luke chapter 1 and then... Then we saw later on in Luke 3, we saw the account of uh, John's bold preaching ministry and his ministry of baptism out in the Judean wilderness. Uh, But let me give you some reminders about John the Baptist. Uh, What do we know about this key figure in the Gospels? Uh, First, remember that John was a prophet. John was a prophet. His introduction to the scene reads just like most of the other prophets in the Old Testament, actually. Uh, Luke 3, verse 1 and 2, it says, Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And so that, that's biblical structure. That's a way of indicating this is a man of God speaking the words of God. And this is the time frame in which he did so. And so as a, as a prophet, John declared the word of God to the people. His birth and ministry was actually foretold by the prophets as well. In the the book of Malachi, 400 years prior, it it tells about one who is going to come and prepare the way of the Messiah. And also in Isaiah, the same thing, 700 years prior. And so John is uh, like a prophet of prophets. He would be the last prophet, in fact, to prepare the way for the Messiah before he showed up. So we remember that John was a prophet. Also remember that John was a set-apart man. He was... Set apart. He was distinct. He was a, he was a ruddy man of the wilderness. Uh, remember what we read earlier in Luke? John lived away from the culture. He lived out in the desolate Judean wilderness where he ate bugs. He uh, dressed in garments made out of camel hair. We would have seen him and been like, wow, look at that crazy Rastafarian guy over there. <laughs> He'd have big dreadlocks, dirty, out there in the desert by himself. Now, part of the reason that he was set apart was because of a vow that he had taken. He was a Nazarite, which this is a a particular vow that Israelites would take, consecrating themselves to the service of God. And part of this vow was to, number one, abstain from alcohol. Number two, to let the hair grow without cutting it. And three, to avoid defilement by contact with anything dead. And so John was, was set apart. He was living out in the desert, wholly devoted to God, and that's what makes this next part kind of interesting, is he's out there, but he's also a bold preacher. So he goes to a place where there's nobody, and then he starts preaching, and then people come to him. They flock to him out there uh, to hear his message. 
And John's message was, was truly unique. He, he spoke the truth in power. He was no respecter of persons. He called out the respected but hypocritical religious leaders of his day. Uh, he even went so far as to call the Pharisees and Sadducees a brood of vipers. He called out Herod the Tetrarch for the sin of stealing his brother's wife. And so he didn't, he didn't even mind calling out the leaders for their sin. And he appears fearless in his rebukes of sinfulness. And so he preached about repentance, a way to escape the impending judgment of God. So John was a bold preacher. One more thing we know about John was that he knew that Jesus was the Messiah. When we see Jesus early on in Luke, we see him coming to the River Jordan. John, who is his cousin, sees Jesus, and he spontaneously cries out, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so he, he identifies him, his cousin. He would have grown up together with him, and yet here he is, filled by the Spirit to announce hey, this is the Lamb of God who has come to save us from our sins. Later on, he he testified that Jesus was the Son of God. He said that directly. And then he saw when the Spirit descended and rested on Jesus like a dove out of heaven and, and remained there, John knew it beyond a shadow of doubt. His own cousin was the Messiah, and then he was given the privilege of baptizing Jesus himself. So those are all the things we know about John. And then there's one more thing that we see that we've learned from Luke, is that John was imprisoned. And this is where we find him as we pick up the text today. Uh, Remember how we just talked about John had the audacity to declare to Herod, that evil king who stole his brother's wife, that he needed to repent. Called him out. And guess what? It, It turns out that people who are in love with their sin don't like to be told that they need to turn from it. And so here's Herod in his pride tired of being called out, he decides to just chuck John in prison. And that's where John is. He, he winds up in jail right as Jesus' ministry is ramping up. And this is where we still find John as we get to the middle of Luke 7. He's stuck in a dungeon, and he's experiencing a, a dark night of the soul. So let's get into the text together. Verse 18 of Luke 7 reads this way. The disciples of John reported to him about all these things. So once again, The context, what just happened, Jesus had just restored a son to life from this widow in Nain, and he did many other miracles. So John's disciples are following Jesus, and they're getting to see all this with their own eyes. But John himself does not get to see this. Why? Because he's locked up. He can't see it, and so he only gets word about all of this. And then verse 19, summoning two of his disciples... John sent them to the Lord, saying, Are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? And does that strike you as strange? Uh, Because it it did for me as I study this passage. It's kind of a shocking question for John to be asking, considering what we know about him, right? We know he's a prophet, set-apart man, bold preacher, believer in Jesus. And yet here he is, he's in prison, getting a report of all these amazing stories, Jesus casting out demons, rebuking fevers, healing withered hands, healing the sick from long distance, remember that one? And even raising the dead. And all of this we think should just kind of, doesn't this just kind of reinforce what you believe, John? What you already know? Shouldn't this just bolster your faith? But we read this verse and remarkably, surprisingly, even maybe tragically, this glimpse of Jesus' power doesn't reinforce John's faith. In fact, it seems like it does the opposite. He actually starts to doubt. You're wondering, what, what's going on here? Well, what I think we're seeing here is a crisis of faith. This is a crisis of faith. Why is this happening to John? Well, because he's hearing about all these amazing things happening to everyone else. And where, where is he? He's in a dungeon. What he himself is experiencing doesn't seem to be matching up with what he knows about the Lord. And so he asked Jesus, really two questions in one there, are you the expected one, or do we look for someone else? And it kind of makes you wonder, you know, how did this bold prophet start to wonder if all this is really true? And I think the answer is that pain can do some stuff to your heart. Maybe you've experienced that before. You've had pain in your life for any any sort of reason. 
loss of a loved one, betrayal, sin, any, anything that's part of the curse of sin in this world, it can really discourage you. And here's John, he's in chains, he's locked up in this cold cell, all for being faithful to his calling, by the way, and he starts to wonder, if Jesus is really the Messiah, then why aren't we getting the show on the road? What's the hang-up? You know, depose Herod, get me out of this prison, and, and come like a refiner's fire to Israel, like all the prophets were talking about. Are you there, Lord? Are you, are you in control? Are you loving? Are you really worth following? What, what's the plan here? Unless maybe I got this wrong. Maybe Jesus isn't, isn't the Christ. And so you can kind of see how his spirit is getting deflated. And you know, a lot of commentators struggle with this passage. I, I was kind of surprised as I studied to read what some of the commentators make of this. Some of them think that John is just play acting here. That he's just, he's just saying this stuff, uh, but he doesn't mean it. And, you know, it's like, okay, that makes John a liar, not a doubter. And then Jesus just kind of plays along with it. Weird. I, I, don't, I don't buy it. I don't see it. That's not a viable option for me. No, I think the, the more obvious truth here is that John is actually struggling with doubt. And, you know, I don't think that should be something that really surprises us because this is real life. This is what goes on in the heart of a man when God doesn't take him out of a jail cell. Is it really so strange for us to realize that a hero of the faith can wrestle with doubt? Have you ever wrestled with doubt before? I think of uh, other men of God in the scripture, like King David, for instance, who the scripture says he was a man after God's own heart. He certainly had his low moments. And it's recorded for us in the Psalms. Just listen to what he wrote. Psalm 10, verse 1, he says, Why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? And then Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Far from my deliverance are the words of my groaning. Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And by night, but I have no rest. So there's David, the man after God's own heart. And then you have Elijah, the famous prophet who we find in, in 1 Kings 18, he's victoriously challenging hundreds of false prophets to this epic showdown on Mount Carmel. And Yahweh shows up and, and proves himself to be the one true God. But then we read one chapter later, 1 Kings 19, he's on the run from one evil woman named Jezebel who threatens his life. And he despairs to the point where he even asks God to take his life. Just kill me now, God is what he says. So Elijah, the amazing prophet. Then there's other prophets like Habakkuk, who felt like his, his prayers were bouncing off the ceiling. You read the intro to Habakkuk, he says, How long, O Lord, will I call for help, and you will not hear? I cry out to you violence, yet you do not save. He was living in a very tumultuous period of, of history there. And he's saying, God, why, why aren't you doing something about all this chaos that's going around here? And so we see, this is what can happen when we encounter serious trials in life. Our faith can shake and teeter and sometimes fall. Our pain, our challenges, our bummers can make us start to question things that we used to be so sure about. And as we will see, Jesus actually cares about our doubts. He cares about us when we're in that state. He wants us to be equipped for these dark seasons. And so watch Jesus' response to John, the messengers that he sends out. Look at verse 20. When the men came to him, they came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist has sent us to you to ask, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? Verse 21. At that very time, he cured many people of diseases and afflictions and evil spirits, and he gave sight to many who were blind. And he answered and said to them, Go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. Blessed is he who does not take offense at me. And so I, I, as we look at these words of, of Jesus and his response 
to his troubled cousin John in prison. I, I think we can learn some things here. What should we do when we're hurting and it appears like God isn't showing up? And so what, what do we do in this dark night of the soul? Uh, well, first things first, we look to Jesus. In a dark night of the soul, we look to Jesus. Not turn away from him, but rather turn to him. And this is the opposite of what we want to do in our flesh. It could be tempting to, to forsake God in our dark moments, but that's the exact opposite of what we really should do. We really ought to go directly to the Lord. And notice that John actually models this for us. What does he do with his doubts? He communicates with Jesus about them. He sends his friends to ask and inquire. He, he's not making accusations. Rather, he's asking honest questions. And then I just love how Jesus responds. He, he's so kind to John to respond to him in grace. He, he doesn't act like we tend to when people doubt us. You ever had anybody doubt your word or doubt your intentions? You get offended, right? But God... He's so merciful. Do you remember what Jesus' response was to the most famous of doubters? Who's that? Who's the most famous doubter? Thomas. What was Jesus' response to him? Uh, it's, it's in John 20. Let me read it for you. It said, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were saying to him, We have seen the Lord, the risen Lord they're talking about. But Thomas said to them, Unless I see in his hands the imprint of of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side I will not believe after eight days his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them Jesus came the doors having been shut and stood in their midst and said peace be with you then he said to Thomas reach here with your finger and see my hands and reach here your hand and put it into my side and do not be unbelieving but believing a rebuke to be sure, but a very gentle rebuke. How kind is our Lord to us when we doubt him? And so when we do have these, these seasons, first we should look to him because we know how good he is. And this is the second part, is remember the character of Jesus. Remember the character of Jesus in the dark night of the soul. Jesus here, at first he, uh, he appears to ignore John's questioners. All right, they, they came out with these questions, and what does he do? He just continues to do miracles and vast healings. And he puts his, uh, his love, his goodness, his power on full display. And then finally, he turns back to them and says, just go tell John what you saw here. Remember that I'm powerful, that I'm loving, that I'm good. Just tell him what you saw. And, and Jesus, in saying this, he's actually confirming his identity once more for John, who knew that he was the Messiah, you just need to remember that. Remember who Jesus was. Jesus is uh, making allusion to some messianic prophecies about him. Found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 35, verse 5 and 6. A prophecy written 700 years before Christ says this about the coming Messiah. That when he comes, then the eyes of the blind will be opened and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. For waters will break forth in the wilderness and streams in the Arabah. And then further on in Isaiah, there's Isaiah 61. Do you remember when, when Jesus, he goes to his hometown synagogue? He's handed the scroll and it's at this very passage and he reads this. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set free those who are oppressed to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And then he handed the scroll back to the attendant, sat down and said, this is fulfilled in your hearing. I'm here. I'm the Messiah. And then he just backed all of this up by just healing people, casting out demons, and doing miracles. And all of these messianic miracles were happening. And notice Jesus just speaks and things change. He's, he's reversing the curse of sin and he's showing that he's always in complete control. And he's, he's using this as a way to comfort John in his season of doubt. Saying, you know, remember who I am and what I can do. You know, unless there was a specific reason 
I have for you in prison, I could spring you out of there just like that. Now this leads us to the, the last point here, what to do in a dark night of the soul. Look to Jesus, remember the character of Jesus, but then also fix your heart on eternity. Notice verse 23, Jesus speaks of beatitude, this, this word of blessing. He said, blessed is he who does not take offense at me. That, that Greek word offend here is where we get the word scandalize from. A stumbling block is a scandalon, an offense. This word means to put a stumbling block or impediment in the way upon which another may trip and fall. It's kind of like the, a spring on an animal's snare that snaps the trap. And so Jesus, he actually also warns John here with these words in verse 23. He's warning him, you know, be careful, John. You're on a ledge. You're in the pit right now, but you could fall into a bigger pit by letting go of God, by being scandalized to the point where you stop trusting in God. And he's encouraging him to lift his gaze above this temporary life. And you see, there's, there is no life away from God. So we need to hold fast to Jesus, and he's going to usher us all who believe into a safe eternity. And you know, what's, what's interesting as we read this passage, here's John in his dark night of the soul, and the stark truth as we continue reading Luke is that he's never going to get out of this thing. He's never going to get out. He'll never actually leave this prison. As the story unfolds, we learn that he's going to be beheaded by Herod, the same Herod who threw him in prison. He's going to be beheaded at the request of some dancing girl. And it's a nauseating scene. It's, it's perverse. It's unjust. And it just shows what a dark world that we truly are in. But what we've seen in our study of Luke is that, that Jesus has solved every problem brought to him so far. But that wasn't his plan. For John. That wasn't his will for John the Baptist, so he, he didn't intervene. His will for John was that he remain steadfast until the very end and die a martyr's death. Now, maybe you're like John today. Maybe you're in a season where you are teetering in your faith. Jesus spoke assuring words to John, and guess what? He's speaking to you too in order to keep you from falling away because we're prone to wander, but I want you to please listen to his word today. Hold fast to him, and he'll hold fast to you for all eternity. No matter what happens in this life, we have all eternity to look forward to. And you know what? John did just that. After this moment, we see him still holding fast to his faith, holding fast to the Savior. And with one stroke of the sword, he was ushered into heaven, where eternal bliss and rewards surely awaited him. So in our dark nights of the soul, let's look to Jesus remember his character, and fix our hearts uh, on what's eternal, what awaits us as believers in heaven. And now we get to verse 24. Did you know that the Lord can get sarcastic sometimes? I know some of you guys can get sarcastic sometimes. I've heard it. I've seen it. Uh, but this is sanctified sarcasm, okay? <laughs> this, is the, this is the real deal here. Now, the messengers of John had left. He... Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? So Jesus is looking at this, this massive crowd who had gone out to the middle of nowhere to hear John preach, be baptized in repentance. And then he asked them, why'd you guys all go out there? Uh, and he used this image of, you know, the Jordan River was there. It's probably similar to our, our rivers here just a bunch of reeds along the bank. He's like, did you guys go out there just to see some reeds shaking in the wind? In other words, did you go out to see some kind of coward preacher? Some pushover? Some spineless jellyfish of a prophet? Somebody whose philosophy was, oh, just live and let live, you know? Who am I to say what's right and wrong? It's like, no, that's not who John was at all. Certainly not. And we, we have John's sermons on record in Luke chapter 3, he was not a man who was easily shaken. Consider this your trigger warning, okay? This is a trigger warning. Luke 3, verse 7 through 9. This is John's preaching. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, 
Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore, bear fruits in keeping with repentance, and do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that from these stones God is able to raise up children to Abraham. Indeed, the axe is already laid at the root of the trees. So every tree that does not bear a good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John's not the guy you hire to write your Hallmark cards. Right? You see, he's not pulling any punches there, is he? He's not trying to please people. You know, there's not a lot of uh, preachers of mega churches building huge churches on, on platforms like this. You snakes are going to burn, you know? But John was a man with firm convictions. He knew what he believed on very controversial issues. He believed in right and wrong. He believed in sin and judgment, in repentance and salvation, and that Jesus was the way to salvation, who came to pay the price to free sinners, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so John the Baptist was not a reed shaken by the wind. He was, he was not a politically correct people pleaser. He was a man with beliefs that came straight from the word of God. And he was a prophet. And this matters because of something that Jesus is now going to teach us about John. Look at verse 25. So he's still talking to the crowd. He says, but what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Those who are splendidly clothed and live in luxury are found in royal palaces. So Jesus is continuing to be sarcastic here. So he's, did you guys go out to John to find some, you know, some softy, some diva, seeking the easy life? A pretty boy preacher? $900 sneakers? A crest white smile? Versace suit? Is that, is that who you guys went out to see? Somebody living in the lap of luxury? No. John was not in the king's palace, he was in the king's prison. And he wasn't trying to fit in or be cool. Verse 26, but what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes. I say to you, and one who is more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. So it wasn't only Jesus who was fulfilling prophecy, his forerunner, John the Baptist, also was fulfilling prophecy. And you know what? He was not only a prophet, he was a unique prophet because he was a prophet prophesied by another prophet. And that's why, uh, incidentally, you look at the text, it's in all all caps that's showing that it's uh, an Old Testament direct quote. Jesus quotes the, the words of the prophet Malachi hundreds of years before that John was the promised messenger who was going to prepare the way for Messiah. So as we've seen, John was simply obeying God's calling for his life. He did this. He announced the way of Messiah. He called for people to prepare their hearts and repent. And where did that obedience lead John? Not to a palace, not to a comfortable life, not to a popular life, but rather it led into a prison cell. And this is a a big point today, that obedience to God will always bring opposition. Obedience to God will always bring opposition. This is one of the the big lessons as we consider John the Baptist. And you know what? Welcome to following Jesus. This is kind of what you signed up for. 2 Timothy 3 verse 12 says this, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. And John is an example of that. Have you ever noticed that it's often when you take a step towards obedience to the Lord, that seemingly out of nowhere in comes some kind of crisis, criticism, financial trouble, a health scare, false accusations, bouts of depression. Why is that? Why is that? Well, one reason is because Satan opposes you. Satan hates sold-out followers of Jesus Christ. And in fact, if you aren't under attack then maybe you aren't living the Christian life. Satan's fine with you right where you're at if you're neutral and unfruitful. You pose no threat to the kingdom of darkness, so the enemy doesn't need to discourage you or try to neutralize you. But here we have John, on the other hand, he's the forerunner of the Messiah, and he's posing a major threat 
toward the enemy and the kingdom of darkness. And so Satan's throwing everything at him. He's trying to discourage him. But John is going to persevere in spite of the opposition. He doesn't tap out or quit because deep down he must have known that living for Jesus was worth all of the opposition in the world. And because of all that, Jesus then makes this astounding statement in verse 28. He says, I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And this is a principle worthy of note. Greatness in the eyes of God is different than greatness in the eyes of the world. Another lesson we learned from John the Baptist's legacy. So Jesus makes this huge statement that no one is greater than John, born of women. A huge statement, especially when you consider all the, all the people that we read about in our Bible. I mean, greater than Moses? Greater than Abraham? Greater than David or greater than Noah? Really? And then we think about John, and, and certainly he's unique. He's the only prophet who had one foot in the Old Testament, one in the New his ministry was what broke the 400 years of silence of, of that period between the Testaments. He was the only one person in the history of the world who had the blessed experience of baptizing Jesus, the Son of God. And so are there, there are many unique things about him. But you know what? Not everyone sang John's praises. We're going to see in, in just a few verses in verse 33, we see that John's opposers even had the nerve to say that he was possessed by a demon. And yet here we have Jesus, our great God and Savior, calling him the greatest of all time. I'm looking at the young folks here. Jesus is the greatest of all time. The goat. If you live for Jesus and serve Jesus and love Jesus, the world's going to call you nuts, but Jesus is going to call you great. And guess what? His opinion matters more. Verse 29. When all the people and the tax collectors heard this, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. And so here we see two polar opposite responses. Some were grateful for John. He had a hard message, but it brought them in a right place with God. And so they responded to his message. They repented and were baptized. But other people, they were scandalized by John. Like, I can't stand that guy. He's always making me feel uncomfortable. I, I hate that guy. I, I'm not a sinner. I don't need to repent. I don't need to get baptized. You know what, John? He's, he's crazy. He can't be from God. And you know what? That same group that rejected John will go on to reject Jesus himself. And Jesus knows that, of course, which is why he says this next. Verse 31, he says, To what then shall I compare the men of this generation? And what are they like? They're like children who sit in the marketplace and call to one another. And they say, We played the flute for you, and you did not dance. Sound like maybe a group of Baptists. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we played the flute for you, and you did not dance. We sang a dirge, and you did not weep. For John the Baptist has come eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. The son of man, that's him speaking of himself, has come eating and drinking, and you say, behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. So in the rejection of Jesus, the, these Pharisees and lawyers they actually use part of a phrase that comes from Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 20, which reads, They shall say to the elders of his city, This son of ours is stubborn and rebellious. He will not obey us. He is a glutton and a drunkard. They're alluding to this passage from the law, the Mosaic law, which described the penalty for a rebellious son in ancient Israel. And so essentially what these guys are saying is that Jesus deserves this. This guy deserves to be stoned to death. And so in response, Jesus takes their, their real-life rejection and he tells a parable in order to make a spiritual point. And it's a short story. It's based on the marketplace, which was the, the town center 
of the ancient world where people went to exchange goods, engage in, in commerce. Maybe if you traveled to that area of the world, you know what the souk looks like. It's this uh, vibrant place in the city where people are, are buying and selling. And you know what's common when, when adults are doing business? Their kids do what? They scatter and go find some place to play. Because adults are boring, right? <laughs> Let's go play. And we see this all the time. You know, after church, our kids run out into the grass and, and play together. And their kids would, would make up games. And, and often the games they would play are based on what they see adults doing. They would mimic their parents. And we see that all the time too, right? Dads were fixing something in the house and your son comes over and he's got a screwdriver in his hand. He's about to jam it down his throat. Give me that thing, you know. But they come over, they want to help. They got a hammer. They got some screws. They got some nails. And then, and then they see mommy cooking and so they come over with their little kitchen set, little, little fake pan, things like that. Now, for kids in those days, the two most popular games for them would have been based on the, the most popular things that they would have seen, big events in the community, which are a wedding and a funeral. These are the things that, that draw a crowd, a big spectacle, especially when you're living in first century Israel. The Jewish wedding, for instance, was a huge week-long affair Quite a spectacle. And then the funeral was also a spectacle. We just saw one in, in Luke chapter 7, where it's a, a, a big line of people, a train of mourning people following this body being carried in the streets as it goes to be buried. And so the kids, they're, they're considering the wedding and the funeral, and they start to mimic and play games based on these things that they see. And so sometimes they play the happy game, the wedding. You know, hey, you be the, the husband, I'll be the wife, and everybody else be the, the witnesses, and then we'll, we'll pretend like we're having a party. So that was a happy game. Other times they played the sad game, the funeral. You know, how, how about you be the dead person this time, and we'll, we'll carry you down the street, that kind of thing. Who, who knows, maybe Jesus even played these games himself when he was a kid. And, and here is where we see the genius of Jesus' parable, which some people call the parable of the brats. Jesus compares these Pharisees to spoiled brats playing in the marketplace. He's like, we just can't win with you guys. You always want your game your way. You take your ball and go home if you don't get what you want. You criticize, you gripe, you complain. Nothing makes you guys happy. For instance, John came and he played the sad game. He preached repentance of sin. And guess what? You rejected him. He said, we don't like him. He, he's too negative. And then, then I came. The Son of Man came, Jesus. And I came and played the happy game. I'm going to feasts. I'm going to parties. I'm preaching forgiveness and grace. And you guys reject me and say, you know, we don't, we don't like you. You're too positive. Why are you always celebrating with, with evil people? <laughs> All you guys do is criticize and blast and insist on having your way all the time. And as you do that, you're missing the glorious message of the gospel. God is trying to speak to you guys. He's revealing who he is and what he wants. He's using John's message of repentance and my message of forgiveness. And you guys are shooting the messengers. And you're being brats. You guys are, are being like little kids, capricious children. And so Jesus says, let me tell you about some other children. Verse 35, yet wisdom is vindicated by all her children. You know, there's wise children, children of God. Those who accept the gospel message. And those who are thankful. The ones who followed Jesus and John were proof enough of the correctness of their teaching. And they were thankful children of God. And as we look at our lives, there's many reasons to be thankful. We can be thankful for this church family that we have here people that we can lean on. Uh, we can be thankful for songs to sing. And by the way, they're, they're his songs, they're not ours. Thankful for God's word passed down to us through great sacrifice. We can be thankful for God's grace, which is undeserved and overwhelming. And certainly we can be thankful for Jesus, our great God and Savior, and for the wonderful truth that, that Jesus came and has asked us to play his happy game. Forgiveness and grace. 
So let's be wise children. Let's be thankful kids, the grateful children of our gracious God. Because Jesus came to save us from our sins by dying on the cross for us and rising to life on the third day. And we can freely receive forgiveness if we would just repent and trust in him. And so as we conclude today, are you struggling with doubt? Are you like John? You're, you're kind of teetering in your own crisis of faith. I would urge you to, to go to the Lord. And also receive prayer and encouragement from the church family. Let's pray together. Let's, let's seek biblical answers to your questions. Uh, because we have questions, and that's okay. Maybe it's something else that God's speaking to you through his word today. Are you convicted of being a compromiser? Are you like a reed in the wind, just bending to the culture? Or are you like, like John? Are you firm? Or, or are you pursuing luxury rather than Jesus? Are you, are you seeking greatness in the eyes of the world rather than in the eyes of God? In all these things, repent and pursue the Lord with boldness. Let's look to the example of John the Baptist, who, as we see, remained faithful through his dark night of the soul and was great in the eyes of the God that he gave his life for. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. I pray that I would not return void. Father, that you would speak to our our hearts and mold us into the people that you want us to be. We thank you for these great examples in scripture of flawed heroes like John the Baptist, the cousin of Jesus. Here we find him in in a dark night of the soul asking these questions, you know, is, is, is this really real? Why aren't you doing anything yet, God? And yet you comforted him with the identity and and work of Jesus, who is still at work, and he still lives, and he still comforts. So, Father, I pray that you would comfort your people through the person of your son, Jesus Christ, who is our victor. He's our amazing God who conquered death and gives us joy, ushers us in, to his kingdom. Father, if there's somebody in here today who needs to repent and trust, would they do so now? Acknowledging their sin before you, confessing that to you, but then turning in trust and confessing that Jesus is Lord, that he took their sin away by dying on the cross. He paid the penalty that, that we ought to have paid and he lived the life that we couldn't live, a perfect sinless life. And so, God, you accepted his sacrifice for sin, and all who trust in him will be saved. So, Father, if there's somebody who needs to make that decision, would they do so now? Saying, Jesus is Lord. Father, I believe that he died on the cross for my sins, was buried and rose on the third day. Father, now as we uh, come to the table, we remember the awesome sacrifice that Jesus made for us, shedding his blood allowing his body to be beaten. As we take the the bread and the cup, we remember the cost of our salvation and we take it with great thankfulness. Lord, we we examine our hearts. There's areas of our life that we need to turn over to you. We do so now. Lord, heal us. Restore our souls. Thank you for the gift of Christ. In his name we pray, amen.